Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brittany Button, Long-Term Care Insurance Specialist for Art Jetter & Company. Today, we're joined by Larry Moore with National Guardian Life. Now, as you know, because you're registered, today we're going to review the chart, that is C-H-A-R-T, sales track, to demonstrate how and when to ask the right questions when discussing long-term care planning with your clients. Now, at the end of the session, we want to answer any and all questions you may have regarding long-term care insurance and the planning conversation. Simply type in those questions into the chat box of this presentation. So with that, Larry, let's get started. Will do. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much, Brittany, for having me on this call. Um, we're going to talk about a sales track, and, and quite frankly, uh, selfishly, I, I initially built this track for me when I was selling a while back, and I use it to work with agents on. In fact, uh, this week I uh, was working with a couple of uh, other agents who were really trying to figure out how, how to maybe sell this stuff more efficiently. And that's really what the track's all about. It's really to remind you of specific things and areas that you want to focus on within the sales call just to make you more impactful and to be more organized. And also, ultimately, to get into the buyer's head. That's what we want to do. Because once you find out what's driving the buyer's need emotionally, then you're about half the way there, as well as looking at other clues also. So getting right down to it, what does this chart stand for? Well, the C stands for really setting the context as much as anything else. But you're probing in a number of areas about what their concerns about long-term care might be, what are they interested in, right? That's really what you're trying to get down to. The last thing you want to do is start off with, hey, tell you what, I'll get a, get a couple of illustrations to you and then we'll talk about it. That's not how you do, do it, at least with this product, all right? So setting the context is probably where you're going to spend maybe 60% of your time, quite frankly. It's about asking a lot of good questions. And I, I have some scripted language within this presentation just to give you an idea of what to say. I'm not here to tell you how to say things. I don't want to change you from you, <laughs> but to give you some ideas about things that you should be saying and probing for uh, in setting the context. Once we have a sense that this is something somebody is generally interested in uh, or really appreciates that it's important that they do something about their long-term care planning, obviously we go right to health, right? We want to pre-qual their health carefully just so we're not wasting their time and you're not wasting your time. If in fact their health looks to be sufficient or they can qualify for long-term care insurance, then it's a question of how aware are they already about what long-term care planning is all about? Because one of the challenges I have seen over the years, and I blame the way my, my industry has marketed long-term care insurance, there's this presupposition that it only has to do with old sick people that wind up in nursing homes and that's what long-term care is all about when it's a much bigger subject. So awareness is important. You may find that they're already very aware and there's not a lot of education there or that you need to correct their thinking a little bit. So that's what the awareness is all about. And then from that point, it's a question of do they have the ability to pay for this? And if so, we're just going to go right in, transfer the risk and, and complete the application, right? So that's the idea about what charts are about. So if, if you can take this concept, if you will. Apply it to how you approach long-term care using your word, but just knowing the kinds of information you need to extrapolate at certain points of the call, it will make you more efficient. Um, let's go right down to it. So setting the context. This is where you sit down with your client or you're in front of your client with a Zoom session or whatever, and you want to ask, you know, what are their perceptions about long-term care planning right up front? The reason why you want to get down to that point is that you want to find out, are they harboring any preconceived ideas that will get in the way of them making a decision, right? So in other words, you want to get a sense of what's on their mind right away. And then it, during this whole aspect of setting the context, you want to take copious notes about the words they use, specific words, phrases, uh, ideas that they bring up. because if they say it, it's true. If you basically say it for them, well, that's your opinion. But you want to use the words, write them down in terms of the context of how they utilize them. And 
also, you want to observe other things. So, for instance, I was talking to an agent this morning. Um, we were kind of doing a little coaching session last week. And she noticed that when during the Zoom session, behind this guy, there were all kinds of awards. He was a competitive cyclist. May have still been. And she missed an opportunity there because, as you know, competitive cycling, bicycle cycling, it's a, it can be dangerous. You can get hurt. You can get disabled doing that. And had she clued on to that, that that was important to him to show that his awards were there and that he had earned these awards, she could have taken it a step further and say, you know, it's interesting. You probably have seen some pretty crazy accidents uh, in your competitive cycling days, haven't you? And he probably would say, yes, I have. Have you ever been in one yourself? Well, I've had a few close calls. Well, you know, if you wind up being like a Christopher Reeve scenario, you flip, fall on your head, become a quadriplegic, guess what? Your long-term care insurance would pay for your care that way too. You know, anything you can do to make this more relevant to them is important. So in setting the context in an effective way, what you're doing is you're paving the way for a sale because you have gotten into the buyer's head, or at least that's the goal. Secondly, you want to discover if there's something preventing them from getting the insurance. You know, oftentimes they say that's an objection. Well, objections could be either something truly objectionable that they object to in what you said, or there's a condition in the way of them making a decision. They don't have the money, or their health is not adequate to qualify, right? One or the other. One way or another, in the beginning, in setting the context, your goal is to weed them out as a prospect or keep them as a prospect. You're going to find out if they're emotionally ready to make this decision, right? So that's what setting the context is all about. And I have some questions to share with you as well. So a great place to start because the goal is I, want, I don't want you to feel scripted, but what I would like you to do is I want to take the, the pressure off you and just ask open-ended questions, getting them talking. For instance, what's prompting your interest in LTC planning? You know, why are you interested in doing this? When you hear the term long-term care, what images do you see? That's a big one because that's where there's a lot of preconceived ideas of, I'll call it Grim Reaper, right? They think, oh, well, what do I see? I see old decrepit people in this institutionalized setting. That's not going to be me. That's why I don't even really, really want to talk about this, right? Um, have you had any personal experience or know somebody who's needed long-term care? So. If you find you've run into somebody who's actually had experience, boy, probe deeply and widely on that experience. Was it, if it was their mother, wow, what happened to your mom? What kind of care did she need? How long did she need it? How were you directly impacted by that, right? That's the kind of discussion you want to have. And as you're having that discussion that this person was in fact directly impacted what did that impact manifest itself to? Was it physical? Was it physical and emotional? Was it physical, emotional, and financial? There's a treasure trove of information if, in fact, they've had direct experience. If they didn't, well, if they, who, who do they know that's needed care? Well, it might have been their neighbors, your neighbor's parents. Gee, what do you know about what happened there? And again, who, what, when, where, how? Just probe deeply and broadly about that because obviously, that neighbor's experience impacted your client's thinking as well, right? Um, whenever they bring something up, yeah, my mom had needed care. Tell me more about that. That's a big, that's a great question to ask. Tell me more about that. How did this impact you, right? So once you've really thoroughly vetted this individual from the standpoint of what's prompting their interest, what they're concerned about, you've asked them for clarifying questions, tell me more about that. Um, at this point, you can then end with, you can kind of wrap it up based on everything you shared with me. My big question is this, in absence of long-term care insurance, what is your plan should your health change? Right, let's talk about that. What is your plan should your health change? And guess what, no answer is a bad answer. They may say, well, quite frankly, we're, we've been thinking about self-funding. And your answer always is going to be, well, that's certainly an option. Let's talk about how that would happen, right? And I have some slides that help that, you know, Q&A as well. So from that, once you spent about 15, 20, 30 minutes just in this area, gathering your information, 
if you feel you've got a prospect who's willing and open to talk about this and maybe engage in long-term care planning with you, don't waste any time to go right to their health, right? Um, health is critical because I've seen agents just spend, you know, minutes, hours, just talking to people about long-term care planning, way too much time talking about it, only to find that had they asked some basic health questions up front, they would have learned long, long much, much earlier that, nah, this wasn't a good prospect. They can't qualify. So once you've gotten into their head, then transition to health. That's my recommendation, at least. And here's a, this is one way you can do it. You know, thank you for sharing your thoughts or experiences with me. While I can see that you feel that this type of planning is important to you personally, unfortunately, not everyone can get it. A serious health issue can stop everything. So I'm going to ask you some basic health questions now to determine if this insurance is something you can even qualify for. Makes sense, right? This is your transition. And then you're going to ask them, you know, you're going to take it from this point. They say, yeah, it makes sense. You then want to make sure they understand this the importance of full disclosure. You can, you can, again, shape this any way you want as far as how you'd like to say it, but full disclosure with me regarding your health history is essential at this point. The more I can learn about your health history right now, the better I can determine if this makes sense for you to go through a formal underwriting process. This includes ordering and reviewing your medical records that could take some time, a month of waiting or so. So if I can rule out any obstacles now, this will save us both a lot of time, right? I know you, can, I know you all can say this because what I see often, when, when we see declines come in, half the time almost, the agent is taken off guard or surprised because they either didn't ask enough questions or People lie. They don't tell you the whole story. And unfortunately, there's no way to get around that. So the more you can emphasize what you don't share with me, the insurance carrier is going to find out your health history anyway. So is there anything you need to make me aware of? Right. So from there, here's some basic questions you can ask. How's your health been lately? You know, been good or bad? Uh, are you currently being treated for uh, treated medically for any existing or pre-existing condition? Right. Um, if they're currently being treated for something, that may be a problem. If they're, for instance, in physical therapy, or if they're being treated for a, a, an illness that has not been cured yet, right? Those are problems, right? Those won't get through underwriting. Um, are, is there any planned treatment, planned surgeries, or physical therapy that's been prescribed, but that you have not done yet? That's important. If That means that the health situation is it's not concluded, right? It's still kind of up in the air. Prescription medications, which ones are you on? What are they for? Has your dosage changed in the last six months, right? Any cancer history? Um, are you diabetic? Now, diabetics, diabetes is a big one. It's very common. Type 2 diabetics are very common, almost at epidemic levels, right? Uh, typically, insulin-dependent diabetics uh, don't stand a good chance in underwriting because that means the condition is pretty advanced. Type twos, you know, for instance, our company, if your A1C is seven and a half or less and you don't have any cardiovascular issues, you'll probably be a good risk for us, right? So if are, if you're, are, you're diabe are you diabetic? Do you know what your A1C is? What are you taking for it? How stable has it been? Any heart attack or stroke history, that's important, especially stroke history. Some carriers, including ours, won't take stroke, stroke uh, people with stroke history. Um, how about memory complaints? Now, this one's interesting. I have seen people shoot themselves in the foot, meaning the applicants, where maybe they're hypochondriacs, they just don't think they remember as much as they used to, or maybe there is something honest that they're complaining about. So do they have any memory complaints? If they bring up anything about memory, wow, stop there and really get an understanding for what they're really talking about, right? Uh, if they've had a number of neurological tests that suggest that there's change going on, yet they're still competent today, that's a problem. Uh, any history with depression? Now, depression's a big one these days. Since the pandemic, depression has been at epidemic levels as well. Um, basic depression, mild depression, that's not a problem. It's highly treatable. 
Sometimes it's triggered by an event like a death in the family, a business loss, or something like that. It's major depressive disorders, um, issues like bipolar disorder, severe anxiety disorder. Those can be problematic in underwriting. So if there is a history with depression, get a sense of what the level of depression is and if there is a triggering event that may have caused it. Um, we, we have a, a number of policyholders who are, who are currently being treated for mild depression. They take medications to keep them stable, right? Um, family history is another big one, right? Is there any history in your family with any kind of cognitive impairment, dementia or Alzheimer's? Have you seen this in your family? And if the answer is yes, what's important to our company, for instance, is, well, if it's one person, not that big of a deal. But if it's two people, and the diagnosis of their dementia or Alzheimer's happened before they turned age 75, well, there's a problem there. If it's after age 75, we don't have a problem with that, right? And then ultimately, disability. Are you collecting any disability right now? Now, disability is kind of an important thing because obviously if they're collecting disability, maybe there's something we need to be, be aware of. But for instance, in the military, often people are discharged with a specific level of disability that's not that big of a deal. Um, so when you, if you come across a veteran and they are collecting disability, if, as long as that disability isn't more than 40%, that seems to be the demarcation point, they're probably a good risk for us, right? So anyway, as you can tell, health is important. You wanna get to health right away after you have a good sense of what's going on in the buyer's mind and what's motivating their decision to look at this rule out any any issues as it relates to health right away and you'll be in good shape so once you've taken care of that you've understood you've kind of got a sense of what's going on in their mind about why they want to engage in long-term care planning whether they've had experiences or not all of that you set the context you've kind of ruled out any health issues that might preclude them from getting this then it's a question of gauging their level of awareness right are they very aware about long-term care, um, or do they you know, harbor these preconceived ideas that get in the way of them making a decision? As we say here, key point, your client's level of awareness about LTC may be already very high due to direct experience they had with a family member or a friend who needed long-term care. If that's the case, you don't need to spend a lot of time. They know, right? That's probably what's prompting their interest in doing this for themselves. Um, if this is the case, you can go right into whether they can afford to buy this or not. But if they've had no direct experience with caregiving, taking care of a loved one, you do need to go back to the notes. This is why taking notes when you're setting the context is so important. Because when you can review those comments with your client, when they say, well, you know what, <laughs> you've given us a lot to think about. Well, the good news is if you got notes on the words they said, because their words mean they're true, right, in their eyes, you got something to work with in terms of kind of getting them back in the funnel, for lack of a better term. So with that being said, the importance of taking notes is important, but kind of tying awareness into the misconceptions and rooting out those misconceptions is important. As we say here, deeply held misconceptions left unaddressed will likely lead to the old, hey, thank you very much, but you gave me something to think about now, right? So the common misconceptions we run across is, well, it's not gonna happen to me, right? This happens to other people. I'm just less human than they are, right? It's just not something that's not gonna happen to me. Or LTC, it's, 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 I'm too young to have this conversation with you. And I'm 57 years old, but shoot, my, my family lives a long time and they didn't need care until they're in their 80s. Maybe I'm a little too young to consider this kind of planning yet. Right. Or finally, hey, you know, our game plan is that we can self-fund. You know, we, we, we've set money aside. Uh, our advisor has told us this is possible based on our wealth profile. So I think we're going to self-fund. And again, as I will share with you in a few slides, I always say, well, that's an option. You know, let's talk about that in a few minutes. Right. So from there, in the level of awareness, Let's just start chipping away these misconceptions. It's probably not going to happen to me. My answer is, okay, let's talk about that. What makes you feel this way, considering the fact that both of your parents needed long-term care themselves, right? Or 
if that didn't happen, I still say, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about it. What makes you feel this way? And they'll probably give you some lame answer or justification as to why they think it's not going to happen to them, right? So let's talk about that. Let's, let's get a sense of why they think they're less human than someone else. And then we'll, we'll have some more dialogue about this one. The other one, I'm too young for this kind of planning. I always like to respond, well, that's kind of interesting. Why is that? And the, the hardest thing for salespeople to do is to ask that one question and wait for the answer. You know, if I sat here and went silent for 10 seconds, you could try that after the call because I don't want to waste time on this. You might be surprised how long that feels. I, I With this one agent that she, she just has a hard time asking a question and then stop talking. We, we set aside 20 seconds. Oh my God, it felt, like an, it felt like an hour to her, right? So that's interesting. Why do you feel that way? Why is that? Wait for the answer. And at this point, you'll never be, and I tell people this, you know, once they give me their reason, I said, here's the bottom line. At this point in time, you're never going to be healthier than you are right now. Not to mention that your age-based premium is as low as it will ever be. Most importantly, if you wait, your health could change unexpectedly, preventing you from ever qualifying for this coverage. Makes sense, doesn't it, to look at this now when your health is the best it will ever be and your premiums are the most affordable, right? This is, this is a good comeback because, you know, who's going to argue with this? Yeah, I, I, I'm, at my age, my health will never be any better. And yeah, it's true. The longer I wait, I know one thing for sure, it will cost more, okay? Um, when we talk about it won't happen to me, the probability is actually pretty high that it could. You know, this is a statistic we've utilized for years and years. And, you know, I've been in the industry now 34 years. And this is a statistic that still seems to ring true. You know, once people reach age 65 or older, there's a 70% chance of them needing some form of long-term care in their remaining years. Now, 70% is pretty high. The challenge is we don't know what the magnitude of that is. Is it the result of an accident? You know, did I have, I have a major accident and it was, as a result, I needed help bathing and dressing for a long, long time, right? Um, so it's interesting. I love to ask financial advisors this question. I said, let's, let's talk about this for a minute. Let's say you're on an analyst call. And it was a very credible analyst, somebody you really held high, in high regard that they really knew what they were talking about. And it, that this analyst said, but there's a 70% chance of a major market correction in the next six months, and these are the reasons why. So does that financial advisor take that seriously enough that he or she wants to be ahead of the news with their best clients? Probably. So you think that would prompt that advisor to pick up the phone and call their clients and say, listen, don't want you to panic. We've done great planning together. But I was on an analyst call and that analyst raised some kind of alarming statistics I want to share with you. It's going to prompt a phone call. I know it. I know that audience. Um, why wouldn't it prompt the same level of urgency about your health? But there's a 70% chance your health could change significantly after reaching age 65. Isn't that worth taking a look at and planning accordingly, right? So that's where it won't happen to me. If I'm too young, if I'm too young for this, there's a lot of examples I can point to, and I'm sure that you could point to that can refute that argument. Let's just kind of take a look at some well-known names where people weren't really old when they started to need long-term care. Bruce Willis is the most current example. He was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia in 2019. He's now 67 years old. He's not that old, and sad to say. His illness, his dementia is progressing quickly. Uh, Michael J. Fox, we all pretty much know who he is. He's actually 61 now. I need to update this slide, but he was diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was 29 years old. Patricia Summit, if you never heard of her, she was an amazing basketball coach. She was, a, she was the top collegiate basketball coach, both men's and women's, during her time uh, coaching for University of Tennessee in terms of the number of wins the most successful basketball coach in college history in terms of the number of wins. And at the prime of her career, peak of her career, prime of life, age 59, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It was aggressive and she died at age 64. Okay. 
And then Christopher Reeves, I think he's the poster child for, you know, debilitating injuries, right? Spinal cord injury when he got thrown from a horse at the age of 42, complete paralysis died, you know, about 10 years later. In fact, uh, not a lot of people know this, but he actually ran out of money. As wealthy as that man was, he ran out of money. And uh, Robert Williams, sad to say, uh, with his demise, actually pitched in for his health care expenses the last couple of years of his life, right? So these are a handful of well-known young people that have demonstrated that this is something that can happen when you're younger. And then guess what? There's a lot more. If you really look, there's scores of well-known younger people who've needed long-term care. On the Parkinson side, you know these names, Neil Diamond, Linda Ronstadt, right? All the way down to, you know, um, you think about Ben, ben Petrick, who is a major, uh, major league baseball player catcher, right? These are well-known athletes, right? On the MS side, Christina Applegate, we pretty much know who she is. She's a very funny lady, sad to say diagnosed with MS at the age of 49. She's dealing with some real impacts of that. And you just go down a list of names there, right? These people were diagnosed when they were younger. Um, I say this for a number of reasons. The average issue age on a policy with us and pretty much for the industry is in your late 50s, 57, 58 years old. This is where these people live. If you know of an employer group, if you have a client that either runs a company or owns a business, that individual has key employees, key executives that work for him or her, guess what? This is an incredible benefit that that business can buy for their key employees for the same reason that long-term care a long-term care event does not care how old or young you are all that matters is that you're either two of six adl impaired or can't be left alone due to a cognitive loss right that is it so be cognizant of that don't get hunkered down into this is something for old sick people when young people can be impacted by it too now, now, hitting on the last argument, we're going to self-fund, right? People who typically sell, say this truly believe they can. And in many cases, maybe they do have the money to pay for this. Uh, you know, my grandfather was one who could, uh, in a sense. Um, he moved in with us the last four years of his life. His financial advisor strongly discouraged him from buying long-term care insurance, thought it was a waste of money. Very common back in, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, advisors just didn't get it. And when he and I got to make the phone call together to his advisor, you could have heard a pin drop. You know, he thought, first of all, the advisor thought I was my grandfather calling because we're using his phone. And when I said, no, it's not John, it's Larry, you could have heard a pin drop. And then I proceeded to tell him that, you know, I know that you, for whatever reason, discouraged my grandfather from engaging in any kind of financial planning around long-term care planning, which is too bad, because now we have to figure out what he is going to need to liquidate every month. So we wind up with about $12,000 a month after tax and after paying you and after other expenses to pay for his long-term care. It turned out to be about 14 grand a month in order to cover that $12,000 a month nut. Uh, let's just say the man ate crow that day. But at the end of the day, when we talk about people who believe that they have set themselves up to self-fund, I never criticize them. I always say, for instance, well, that's certainly an option. You know, the average cost of long-term care in your area is X. And my big question is, with a distribution of that size, how long could you afford to pay for that out of pocket before you may be forced to make some significant changes in the way you live? Maybe even being forced to sell your home. A lot of people think, I own a lot of real estate. I'll just sell a few properties. Well, we all know how difficult that is. First of all, you're going to have a big tax to pay. The house may not sell in a convenient time if you want to get what it's worth. So you may be forced to panic sell those investments, right? So that's a big question. How long would a distribution at this rate, 6000 8000 a month, whatever the number is, at what point will that make a big impact on the way you live? Then you can follow that up with, have you considered the trade-offs between carrying the cost of that of care directly, meaning self-funding, versus using a tax advantage device, using tax advantage leverage of an affordable tax-qualified LTC policy to pay the bills instead? 
and then go into this objectively. And I'm going to show you share with you some slides that I do just that. I, I, I'm trying to be as fair-minded about this as I can because there are pros and cons of both self-funding and long-term care insurance. And then what I'll do, I have three examples, and I'll compare the numerical outcomes after 30 years. So this, this is kind of interesting. And I will tell you, for the self-funding crowd, it's pretty eye-opening. So let's just go right into this real quick. I, As I'm looking at the time, we're into this about 30 minutes, probably another 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the most will be done. So here we go. So from left to right, the pros of self-funding versus the pros of leveraging long-term care insurance. Let's look at the left. First of all, if you're going to self-fund, obviously there's no barrier to entry. You don't have to go through underwriting because you have the funding in place. You have full control of your capital. You're fully liquid for the most part, depending on what you own asset-wise any time. Uh, you'll still have that asset if care is never needed. That's what people typically think. Okay, if I, can, if I never need care, at least the money's still there in my investments to give to my heirs. I could pay for whoever I want wherever I want, right? And I don't have to go through a claims process. And those, frankly, are fairly attractive at the surface, right? Now, looking at the upside of leveraging tax-qualified long-term care insurance. First of all, superior purchasing power, converting pennies to dollars, right? You make a small investment, an annual premium. You're going to purchase significantly more buying power than you can if you're going to fund it on your own directly, right? Secondly, there's attractive tax treatment for tax-qualified plans. Memorize IRC 7702B, and that, that, that's the area in the tax code that justifies the tax advantages of long-term care insurance that are tax-qualified. The benefits are received 100% tax-free. What are you paying every time you take a distribution from your investments, right? We'll hit that, hit that on the next slide. Businesses also enjoy unique, unique tax treatment of tax-qualified long-term care insurance if they pay for part of it or all of it, depending on their business structure and depending on your level of, uh, how should I put it, your level within the business. If you're, for instance, more than a 2% shareholder in the business or less, those variables do come into account. But think about this. If I'm a C-Corp, I buy this from my key executive. I can write off the entire cost of that premium as a business expense. And there's no imputed income to the employee who gets it, meaning they don't have to declare additional taxable income. And, of course, if they need the benefits at claim time, they're tax-free as well. So there's an attractive tax story here. A lot of CPAs aren't really, to this day, real familiar with this yet. Um, and finally, with asset-based products, which of course are Jetter offers, you know, they're also called hybrids, um, not only are the premiums guaranteed to not go up, but you can recapture the premiums with the death benefits. So you have a number of tools in your toolbox working with Art Jetter and having access to the market. So those are the upside of both strategies. But then there's also the downside to both strategies. So it's a self-funding. The risk of changing priorities with those investments is real. What if this individual gets a wild hair and wants to buy the biggest boat he ever imagined or wants to do a home remodel or wants to help fund the grandkids' expenses, right? Changing priorities with these investment dollars is always a reality. So if you're setting aside a couple hundred thousand dollars for your long-term care and you think that's enough and that money is sitting there for two years, five years, 10 years, you may, be get, you may get a false sense of security. Well, I haven't needed care yet. Let's start having fun with that money, right? That can happen. Of course, exposure to the market, exposure to interest rate risk with inflation, that's a reality we don't think about too often, but people are thinking about more today. Uh, when care is needed, of course, I mentioned in the last slide, the distributions are going to generally be taxable, right? There's generally both taxable and also the fact that you're going to be paying commissions or exchange fees, right? Um, likely, most likely, people will underfund their long-term care if they're going to fund this on their own. And ultimately, the big question, right? What are your estate planning objectives and how does liquidating that plan prematurely impact those objectives? 
that were at one time very important to you at the level of leaving a legacy or just giving you the life and retirement that you wanted, right? Those are the downsides of self-funding. The downsides to insurance are pretty obvious. There is a barrier to entry. Not everybody can get it, right? Underwriting. Uh, if, if care is needed with traditional products, it's to use it or lose it. Unless you add a return of premium rider, which are very costly, that you could consider that an honest risk. But then again, if I never needed it and died, eh, not a bad thing at the end of the day. People don't think about that side of it. Um, it's like your homeowner's insurance, your auto insurance. Guess what? You're paying that as you go and you may never claim on that either, right? Um, there is the risk of rate increases with traditional products, although these days with the latest underwriting assumptions, the latest claims assumptions, the latest lapse assumptions, uh, the products written and priced in the last five to eight years have been very stable. Uh, it's the older products that were mispriced that gave us the reality of rate increases in a big way. Um, LTCI arguably is an illiquid investment vehicle, if you want to look at it, that, or illiquid financial vehicle, meaning that you're paying premiums into it, but you can't liquidate it. You can't use it until you need care. A lot of people think, well, if I buy a hybrid, I could borrow against the life insurance or the annuity contract, can't I? And the answer is, you can, but keep in mind that the cash values in those two strategies are so thin that you'll crash those policies right away if you try to borrow against them. And then finally, the final downside is I got to file a claim. I got to go through the claims process, right? So those are kind of the downsides to this thing. So you have the upside, you have the downside. Understand those well. And now I'm going to share with you a couple of examples that will kind of drive these points home. The first strategy that we're going to talk about, if you were to self-fund, is this. How about if I just set aside the amount of money I would have paid over the life of this policy uh, in premiums? I'll set aside that dollar amount. So when we talk about, I'll just use NGL as an example, since that's where I got the number from. I've got uh, you know 57-year-old couple. They've got the shared pool, right? $200 a day, the shared pool is um, a way to expand the, the, the purchasing power of that policy. Um, you've got a $200 a day benefit. It's guaranteed to grow regardless of the markets. The value of that contract is guaranteed to grow 3% compound. Um, you've got a 90-day elimination period. It's comprehensive coverage, nursing home assisted living home care. And over 30 years with an annual investment that this couple would make, so an incremental investment drawn from investments, uh, they would have paid $200,640 in premiums over a 30-year period, okay? So the advisor may smartly say, well, why don't we just take that $264,000 and invest it in the market for 30 years? You'll probably be just fine. So when I look at that in scenario one, which we'll look at, invest the $200,640 over 30 years with a pre-tax rate of return of 5%. That's pretty darn good, right? So that's scenario one. Scenario two will then be, well, what would it take for me to set aside enough money to match what the value of that insurance product would be in 30 years? So I'm gonna look at both scenario one and scenario two. Let's start with scenario one. Hey, whatever you paid in terms of premiums over 30 years, we're gonna invest that amount of money at 5% pre-tax. What does that look like? Well. First of all, let's look at this. If you went with the insurance, right, this 57-year-old couple makes an annual investment of $6,688, which on day one gives them $657,000 of tax-free liquidity. So laying this out from left to right, on the left side is the first year, I make my first premium installment of $6,688, that first year, I already have waiting to use a total of $657,000 of tax-free benefits, right? Meanwhile, if you look at the right side, okay, we're going to take the $260,000, $200,640. I've invested that today. I put it in. That's our long-term care fund. Well, that day, I have $264,000 available for my care day one, right? So already a huge difference in terms of purchasing power. So go down to, let's just look down to year 20, right? By year 20, 
I would have spent quite a bit of money in premiums, this couple, $133,760. But look at what's happened to the value of this contract, right? It's got that guaranteed 3% compounding growth factor in there. This couple now has almost 1.2 million tax-free available to them. Go to the right. Well, we've already made, the, you know, we made our single premium, if you want to call it that, or made our initial investment 20 years ago because of the after-tax rate of return or the pre-tax rate of return, excuse me, of 5%, this couple now has $534,263 there. That's growth. That looks good, but it falls far short of what the insurance would deliver. That's why people buy insurance, right? And when you look at that 534000 they say, hey, let's just take a little bit of that and go play. Let's take a little bit of that and buy a couple new cars or build a house or whatever, right? After 30 years, looking again at the left, I've spent, this couple spent $200,640. And for that $200,000 investment, they have almost $1.6 million tax-free available for their long-term care. On the self-funding side, we're far short, $870,984. So when you wrap scenario one up, this couple would have shortchanged themselves a little over $723,000. That's a lot of money, right? So strategy one would have failed, in my opinion, right? Now, the question is, then, the, the advice is, well, let's wait a minute. Let's see what this insurance is going to be worth in 30 years and what we would have to set aside today to accomplish that objective. Well, to do that, here we go, left to right. We see day one. $6,600 investment gives me that $657,000 in leverage, if you will, tax-free leverage. Well, if I'm going to up the ante and, and try to match the performance of the insurance, I would have to set aside, with a pre-tax growth rate of 5%, $368,000. Now, day one, I'm still far short of the objective. If I got in a serious accident, we need to care within the first, call it 10 years, you could see how far short. At year 10, on the left side, by year 10, this couple would have spent over $66,000 in premiums and have $882,000 in benefits to show for it. Tax-free benefits versus $600,000 on the right side. When we get all the way to the end of time, uh, at year 30, you know what the result is for the insurance. They would have had almost $1.6 million for that $200,000 investment. To match that number as close as I could get, that's why I picked 368000 as a self-funding net present value number. But as good as that looks, that's still going to be a taxable distribution. So how much more would I need, would have needed to set aside to account for taxes and distribution costs, right? So when we look at, on paper, scenario two, it does look more attractive I would be short only about $397, but still when I factor in taxes and, and distribution costs, commissions, things like that, I'm still pretty short in where I would ordinarily be. So at the end of the day, here's the deal. We want to take this argument delicately because emotionally people get very wed to the idea of their self-funding, their long-term care. But one way or another, this couple, if they have this kind of money to invest, they have the resources to afford the insurance, don't they? So at this point, it's a question of not whether they can afford it, but if their health is good enough and they're aware of why they need to do this and they have the resources to pay for this out of pocket, they have the resources to buy the insurance. So here's a way to get us to making a decision to get them to transfer the risk out of their portfolio, out of the back of an insurance company. Based on everything that we've discussed today, can you think of any other risk other than the risk of needing long-term care that could involuntarily take away your life savings, potentially wiping it out, while at the same time robbing you of your independence? Not a bad question to ask. An LTC event could force you to deconstruct your entire portfolio or the planning that you put in place. Are you comfortable with that possibility? 
Or here's another one. Ask another way. Or would you like to explore a way to manage and remove this risk from your portfolio to the back of an insurance company and receive tax-free dollars to fund your care as well? What makes more sense to you? Either way, at this point, you're ready to go to the application. So that's the whole chart sales track. It's, the whole idea is you just take these ideas, develop them, and put yourself in, in, a, in a, probably an easier discussion than if you're just going to wing it. So, Brittany, that's kind of the, the long and the short of it. I took 45 minutes of your, these good people's time. Are there any questions or comments on this? So we did have a couple of questions, and I'll, I'll kick it off first. Uh, so it looks like we have some maybe new faces uh, who are interested in learning and starting the long-term care planning conversations with your clients. Uh, so the question came in licensing. So first and foremost, make sure you have your resident or non-resident health license in, in the states you're looking to do business in. But most, not all states, are going to require some type of long-term care CE certification. Now, there's a handful of vendors out there you can get this completed at. Uh, if you're one of those on the call that needs to take the initial long-term care CE certification or even the refresher course that's required about every two years, uh, we have partnered up with webce.com and can get you those courses at a discounted rate. Uh, simply reach out to me or a member of my team and we can get you that link. Uh, so yes, on top of your regular license, you will need that certification in most states. Um, if you're not sure, if your state requires it, again, call our team, we can get you taken care of. Uh, Larry, you got an easy one today. Uh, we got a couple folks want to know, <laughs> can I share this slide deck with them? I, I believe I know the answer, but I'll have it come from your lips first. Sure, absolutely. This is for your own education. Uh, typically, it's for agent use only. So absolutely, you can, you can have this. And specifically, one of the questions that came in, it was definitely just the list of the questions you had mentioned earlier in the presentation. So, you know, get those memorized or just jot them down as something you can reference to uh, in your upcoming appointments. So that's all we have for you all today. I uh, want to thank everyone for taking the last, you know, 45 some minutes out of your day to join us. Of course, Larry, thank you for co-piloting. We always appreciate when you do that uh, for us. But before you go, we are hosting another session with Larry to discuss if insurance is right for your clients. During this session, we're going to take a little bit different of standpoint and look at an objection, objective comparison of pros and cons of self-funding versus purchasing long-term care insurance. So he's really going to go more in depth on those last few slides. Uh, that is coming up on September 21st, uh, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, so if you're interested in registering, Keep it out for your email. Invites are going out or simply uh, give me a call, shoot me an email, and we'll get you registered. However, if you still have questions or, again, want a one-on-one -on -one discussion, feel free to reach out. Our number here is 800-228-0008 or shoot us a quick email at ltci at jetter.com. Again, thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right, Brittany, thanks for having me. You're welcome, Larry. Take care. You take care. Bye-bye.